Hello and welcome to SaaS Leaders Lounge, your go-to podcast for cutting-edge insights into the tech world. I'm your host, Ramon. Today, we continue our AI series by exploring the transformative power of AI in enhancing human interactions. We're joined by Rachel Koza, CEO and co-founder of Virtual Sapiens, and also a former professional ballet dancer turned AI entrepreneur. It's great to have you with us today, Rachel. How are you and where are you joining us from? Uh, it's great, great to be here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm in Boston, Boston, Massachusetts. Fantastic. Lovely area, I must say. To dive straight into it, um, I'm sure our listeners must be thinking, wow, a professional ballet dancer and you was also a nationally ranked athlete. So transitioning from ballet to founding Virtual Sapiens is definitely quite unique. Could you share what sparked this shift? Yeah, it's definitely been a, a long journey. I, it, I, I'm Canadian, so I was on the Canadian national team as a gymnast, and um, both gymnastics and ballet tend to be careers that end early because they're so taxing on your body. And um, I transitioned into the world of ballet when I was 17, which was old for a gymnast, relatively young for a, a ballet dancer. Um, danced with Boston Valley for 10 years, and then I got pretty injured uh, in 2013. Um, so I ended up retiring from the ballet in 2016. And um, I transitioned into a more traditional job, uh, fundraising at, at Harvard University, and was just fascinated with the way that people in this more traditional workplace communicated and the way they used their bodies or didn't use their bodies. And so that laid the foundation for a consulting business I started called Choreography for Business that was all about coaching people in body language and presence. And then when the pandemic happened and video became the main way that we communicated, I thought there was a huge opportunity actually here to leverage AI, which I didn't know very much about at the time, yeah. to yeah. open up access to the kinds of coaching that I used to do in person, but to have the coaching happen during video moments, so in real time. Perfect. No, I completely understand. And sorry to hear about um, the injury. It's great to hear how you landed on your feet, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. But obviously, Virtual Sapiens, I've seen, has recently introduced verbal analytics. How do you envision this enhancing the user experience? Yeah, so when we, you know, taking into consideration my background, which is very nonverbal body language oriented, you know, we started the company and we were strictly focused on computer vision. So the behavioral components of communication that are so distinctive on video, right? Cause it's the main difference between video and a phone call is that video, you actually see the human. So the way the human shows up is very important. Um, and at the time, most other companies were actually just focused on what was being said. And so we were very unique in looking at how people were showing up and, and how what was being said was, was being said, um, which was great. But then what we realized, and this was this happened in the past year, we realized that analyzing what was being said was actually table stakes, right? Like everyone was expecting it now. Um, and so for that reason, we quickly included analytics on vocal components, things like speech speed, intonation variation, repetition, um, filler words, and then verbal analytics as well. So how, how concise are you being? Um, are you coming across with empathy in terms of what you're saying? And that's really been a huge leap forward for us and for our users, um, because now we offer the full spectrum of communication feedback. Um, because we opened opened up with such a focus on the nonverbal, now that we have that verbal component, we're able to offer much more robust feedback than any of our other competitors. Yeah, no, I understand completely. I think that's a significant advancement. It sounds like and it could redefine user engagement and also feedback mechanisms. How does Virtual Sapiens, you've touched on this in your answer just then, but in more detail, how do you use AI to improve virtual presence and also communication for your users? Yeah, so there are a variety of feedback mechanisms is what we call them. So ways that users can interact with our AI to receive feedback. We have our in-call sidekick, which is an in-call coach. So if you're on a Zoom call or a Teams and you have your sidekick running, 
it's an application that runs on your desktop. So it doesn't join the meeting. It's not a bot okay. and you can get feedback in real time. So for example, if I was getting really excited and I was like moving close to the lens and maybe covering my hands with uh, my face with my hands, um, my sidekick would say, Hey, Hey, like take us, take a step back, move away from the lens, take your hands away from your face, you know, th things like that. So I could actually get coached in real time. That's one way yeah. that our AI provides feedback on communication behaviors in real time on video. And then we have what we call our presence portal, which is where you can go and practice. So if you're like, I don't want to have uh, feedback in real time because there's a lot going on in a call, but I would like a safe space to practice. You know, I have an upcoming presentation. I want to run through it or, you know, I just want to get a baseline of how I'm showing up on video and see what blind spots I might have. Our AI does such a good job of reflecting back behaviors to you, right? The AI is very yeah. impartial. So if you're using hand gestures or you're not using hand gestures, or you're looking into the lens when you're talking, or you're not like the AI sees everything and can report back to you, right? Sometimes even if you watch a recording of yourself, it's hard to really understand what blind spots might be holding you back. So that's kind of how our AI works. It's definitely, I think that's very impressive from the in-call agent that you've mentioned. I tend to get very excited from doing calls, especially when there's good news and things like that. So I can see how that will benefit us in recruitment greatly. And even the kind of the presence portal you've mentioned, me and my co-founder dived into doing a podcast with no prior communication training. So just being able to even understand or, or feedback, look back at our videos and know what we can do better. I think that would uh, uh, greatly benefit us. And I can see overall how it can be benefit the wider community. Um, in the era where AI stirs debates around job security and privacy, mm -hmm. how does virtual sapiens tackle these challenges? Yeah, in terms of the privacy, I mean, we're a privacy first company, which means that our embedded within our architecture are certain privacy safeguards for our users. So all of our technology runs on the client's device. So whereas many other AI tools and, and solutions, especially in the coaching world, will like record you and your video and what you're saying and send that recording to their servers and process it on their servers and then ping you back with feedback, all of that for us happens on the client's device. So your likeness which is one of your most valuable assets, uh, never leaves your device, yeah. never leaves your computer. We never see your video, right? Um, so that's one thing that's just, it was a decision we made really early on that safeguards individuals' uh, privacy. Um, and then in, in, in regards to, um, what was the first part of your question? You said privacy. Oh, and then a job, job, Security, security and stuff. <laughs> so yeah, that's a really interesting question. Cause I think sometimes people might be like, oh, so are you just trying to like replace human coaches with this AI coach? And I'm a coach myself. And so that's the last thing that I'm trying to do. Um, and so we actually designed the product such that it can stand alone, but it stands alone up to a certain level of coaching and, and feedback, right? So the type of coaching that our AI gives is fantastic according to certain behaviors and rules. Um, it's great for rep like repetition and practice and, and ongoing reinforcement, but it's not necessarily going to get to the same level of personalized nuance and context that a human coach could. Um, we actually partner with coaching firms and we help amplify the work that coaches do with our tool. So if I'm a coach and I'm using our platform, this platform actually helps me engage better with my coaches. It helps give me a tool that I can assign to them so that they can practice in their own time and get feedback in between our sessions so that the sessions we do are more powerful. And I don't have to spend my time as a coach telling people to fix their framing or that they still used too many hand gestures, you know? Yeah. No, I understand completely. Um, thanks for the detail in your response there. I think storing everything on the client's device, it definitely limits what can go wrong. And you're not 
kind of replacing but increasing quality as they always say someone using AI may replace you not necessarily AI so I think those coaches that are going to be adapting kind of your solution are going to have a, a great advantage than others um, so it's reassuring to hear how virtual sapiens prioritize, prioritizes ethical considerations overall um, looking ahead as AI technologies evolve how does Virtual Sapiens made, maintain its edge in delivering state-of-the-art solutions? Yeah, I mean, it's like we're constantly um, up, making updates in terms of the user's experience, right? So one of the things we found that can be a competitive edge is the seamlessness on the user's end, right? Like we want our coaching and feedback to be so embedded within our users' workflows that it doesn't have to be this separate thing that they go to, right? We want we want to be as as deeply integrated as we can. And so for that reason, we actually are API first, um, which means that when we go to partners, like I mentioned earlier, or uh, even, even customers like L&D departments who might have learning management systems in place already, we can actually integrate directly within those systems so that people don't have to go to yet another website or you know, yeah. um, yet another tech stack, right? Like we, a tool in the tech stack. So we try to minimize um, and simplify the user's experience as much as possible. And that's something that um, yeah. is always taking tweaking. And then the other thing is, you know, as you mentioned earlier, right? Like we just added this year or in 2023, um, all the verbal analytics, right? Like that was a huge upgrade for us. And that helped us be even more competitive in the market. Um, so we're always on the lookout for new metrics that will provide meaningful data to our users, yeah. right? We want to avoid data for data's sake. The why behind the metrics that we, the metrics and insight that we provide is always important. So we're always looking at different behaviors that we might be able to include. Fantastic. I think staying ahead in such a dynamic field must require constant innovation and also adaptability. So staying API first is, is core to this, I believe, as you continue to provide meaningful <laughs> solutions. Um, we did touch on ethics in the previous question, so I should, probably should have followed up this question after that answer. But what are some me ethical measures Virtual Sapiens considers during the development of new AI-driven features? Yeah, I mean, tra tra like, w where has the AI been trained? is our like number one, where and how has the AI been trained is our, our number one uh, question and concern. You know, we are a global company. We we work across nations and countries. Um, and so we have to make sure that the AI is representative of the different groups of people that we might be providing feedback to. Um, so that that happens both in ensuring that the models that we're using have been trained effectively and across multiple ethnicities, uh, races, et cetera, right? Like a human being is a human being. And we have to make sure that we're able to distinguish um, what is a human being from maybe like what is a, a guitar or like a chair, right? We don't want anyone to um, not be viewed as, as, as a human being. That's a number one concern. And then in terms of our AI, the, what we develop in-house, making sure that there's a fine like we have to hit the right balance between being able to give people personalized feedback on the behaviors they're exhibiting without becoming too prescriptive because we don't want users to come away thinking that the AI is telling them specifically how to behave, right? Like we want to always leave a little bit of interpretation on the user's part to take the feedback our AI has given them and say, okay, how am I going to actually implement that? Um, I think that that helps from an ethical perspective, because if the AI becomes too prescriptive, um, the conversation changes from, you know, coaching and feedback to uh, almost like a uniform uniformity in communication, which yeah. is not what we want. Brilliant. No, I think ethical, ethics and AI is a, a pivotal focus. So it's pivotal how your company integrates um, these considerations from the ground up, as you've described. Now to move to more of our lighthearted section of the podcast to try and have some fun before we conclude. It will be great for our audience to know more about Rachel behind the founder of Virtual Sapiens. So um, to move to some quick fire questions, are you ready to start? Brilliant. So would ready. you prefer cooking classes or painting classes? 
cooking. Do you prefer surfing Definitely the cooking. internet or reading? Okay, <laughs> brilliant. Um, do you prefer surfing the internet or reading a book? Reading a book. That's. Um, do you prefer watching plays or musicals? Musicals. Nice. Attending lectures or workshops? Workshops. Yeah, definitely. Homemade gifts or store brought gifts? Homemade, definitely. <laughs> nice one. That's a, a tip for the partner if he does listen to this. <laughs> Comedy clubs or dance clubs? That's a hard one. Um... I actually think now at this stage in my life, like comedy is more interesting to me. I've spent so much time in the dance world. So yeah, comedy. Brilliant. Oh, I thought that would be an interesting one to ask yourself. Um, nature documentaries or historical documentaries? Nature. Beautiful. Science museums or technology exhibits? Hmm. Science museums? Brilliant answer. I guess you're in the tech world all the time, so a similar mm -hmm. response to kind of the dance question as well. Something new. Um, th thank you very much um, for answering those questions swiftly, I must say. But for, we always like to keep a collaborative nature on the SAS Leaders Lounge podcast, so we always have a previous guest answer a question to the next, and you would also have an opportunity to ask a question to the following. A question from our last guest, we had Raul Sonwalker. He's the CEO of a company called Julius AI. His question to yourself, Rachel, would be, in your role as a founder, how do you balance the inherent, inherent ambition of startups with the necessary pragmatism? That's a great question. I feel like it's like a seesaw, you know, like there, there are times where you have to really take some big leaps and you actually get a little ahead of your skis for a period of time. You know, the classic example is like doing a demo that proves a concept, but may not necessarily be possible at scale yet. Right. Um, and that's just necessary. Like you're doing something or you may be doing something. We certainly are, um, that doesn't exist yet or hasn't been done before. Right. So there's a certain level of, um, audacity that you have to tackle, but then at the same time, right. To the question of pragmatism, there comes a time pretty quickly where you have to like rein it in and then actually get down to brass tacks. Like, how are we going to do this and, and make it possible in a way that is highly scalable? Um, so I feel like it's kind of like a, a bit of a seesaw balancing act. Yeah, definitely. And I think it also depends on the circumstances as well. So if Raul did want more information from yourself, considering your experience, and he's just launched around 10 months ago, I'd be happy to connect you both together. On our next podcast session, we've got a gentleman called Sarat and Pedarella. He's the CEO of a company called Hedgehog Lab. They're basically a human-centered global tech consultancy. What would your question be for Sarat on our next episode, Rachel? Yeah, I mean, definitely what comes to mind um, for me in his in his role in his industry is like, what is he seeing and how is he managing the increased capacity of of AI from a development perspective and his human centered approach? Like, how, how are they balancing putting the human first while also leveraging the advancements in AI. Brilliant question to Sarat, and please do tune in to the next episode to find out his answer. Um, before we conclude, Rachel, are you able to share where our listeners can find more about yourself and also Virtual Sapiens? Uh, LinkedIn is probably the best place. We're very active on LinkedIn. Um, and then our website, www.virtualsapiens.co. So that's co, not .com. Fantastic. I'll be sure to put both your LinkedIn and the Virtual Sapiens website in the about us for the YouTube, Spotify, and also Apple Music. But thank you so much for your time today, Rachel. It's been an insightful conversation. And thank you so much for sharing your expertise in AI and communication. To our listeners, don't forget to subscribe to the SAS Leaders Lounge for more episodes like this, where we delve into the minds of industry leaders. Until next time, keep innovating and pushing the boundaries in SAS. Goodbye for now. Thanks again, Rachel.